Good afternoon and uh, thank you for joining us uh, for the third edition in our 2019 series of webinars uh, focusing on biosimilars. Um, this year we're, we're building on the webinar series from last year uh, and looking at some of the burning issues uh, again in, in biosimilars. Today we're going to focus on uh, clearing the way for launch. Um, my name is Matthew Royal um, and I will be giving the European perspective today together with uh, Judith Krenz, um, my partner from Taylor Wessing's Amsterdam office. Um, we are joined by uh, Heather Schneider and uh, Tara Timi from Wilkie Farr and Gallagher who will give a US perspective uh, on these issues and uh, an update on recent developments. So clearing the way in Europe um, I think it's important to start with some basics. So what is uh, the patent landscape in Europe? So typically, European patents are applied for centrally at the European Patent Office. Uh, but on grant, they become national rights, and those are separate legal rights that uh, exist separately. And this means that in order to clear the way, there are essentially two options. You either litigate nationally uh, across tens of countries, which, um, as you will imagine, uh, is very complex and um, quite expensive, or you can challenge centrally in a post-grant opposition. And although this has the advantage of uh, knocking the patent out in toto across Europe, it has the disadvantage that it is not uh, incredibly quick. Um, and sometimes proceedings can take six years or more to reach a conclusion. I've set out um, on the slide the Unified Patents Court. Um, this really is just a, a placeholder uh, to remind you that actually the system may change. Um, currently, the Unified Patents Court is um, uh, stayed pending uh, probably Brexit and also certainly a constitutional decision from Germany. But if and when it comes in, uh, it will provide a, an alternative way of revoking patents centrally in a single court. And so something that very much should form part of your strategy planning for a biosimilar launch. So in devising a strategy to clear the way, um, it's very important to understand the national rules in the different jurisdictions and to use them to your advantage. And so, for instance, uh, in the UK, um, there is the possibility of getting discovery of relevant documents. And there's also live evidence given by experts and detailed cross-examination, which can be a real advantage in litigation. Uh, equally, in, in Germany, proceedings are bifurcated, and so uh, infringement proceedings are considered separately to invalidity proceedings. And again, in some circumstances, that might be an advantage. And then uh, finally, um, arrow declarations are available in the Netherlands and the UK, as we will hear um, later on. They may also be available elsewhere, but those are a really powerful tool for dealing with uh, patent applications that are still pending. So understanding the tools that are available to, to use in reaching the market is a really important part of devising your strategy. Equally, it's important to think about your commercial objectives, because although Europe is a single market, the opportunities uh, in terms of the size of the market will differ across Europe, and they won't be the same for every single product. And so, in some country, in some uh, for some products, uh, it may be very important to clear the way and make sure you have a full launch in Germany and the UK. Whereas in, other, in others, France and Spain may be more important. 
So it's about understanding the national landscape and rules and understanding what your commercial objectives are. So the next thing to uh, think about is the regulatory position in Europe. Uh, biosimilars must be applied for centrally at the European Medicines Agency. And that means that you have a single label across Europe and you must market that product under a single brand name across Europe. And this is particularly relevant if you're dealing with a situation where the patent landscape includes lots of second medical use patents that cover particular indications on the label. There is an opportunity to carve out patented indications from your label to avoid the second medical use patents and allow a successful launch on a so-called uh, skinny label. But as I've already mentioned on the previous slide, patent rights are national and so it's very likely that you will have a different um, coverage of patent rights across Europe. And so the uh, second medical use may be in, patents may be in force in one country, but not another. So how do you maximize your opportunities and uh, reach the, um, the most of the market that you can possibly reach? So there are a number of different options. So one option is to apply for a full label and include all indications, the same indications that are on the brand. If you're going to do that, then that means that you have to launch only in those countries where there is no second medical use patent, um, or you need to clear the way in full across any country that you want to launch in. The second option is the, the other extreme, which is to uh, launch on a skinny label which does not include the patented indication. And that means that you can launch across Europe um, at the same time, but you are not launching on the full um, label, and so you're not, uh, you're, you're not accessing all of the indications on the brand product. And in some countries, there may be no patents enforced, so you may simply be giving up the opportunity of targeting a, uh, a lucrative part of the market. So that leads on to the final sort of strategy option, which is to uh, apply for duplicate marketing authorizations and so to have a skinny label which takes out and carves out the patented indication and a full label which includes all indications. Now, the drawback with that strategy uh, is that there is the added expense of having to apply for duplicate labels. And there's also the problem at, at the end of the life of the patent when you have to switch back to a full label product and therefore switch brands, that there may well be brand confusion on the part of uh, the prescribers and the patients, uh, and, and that could um, be problematic down the road. However, if the situation is, is right and if the market is big enough, then this is a legitimate option to consider. Uh, and we can see that on adalimumab, which was a, a very big market that um, uh, biosimilar manufacturers were looking to enter. Uh, and Amgen applied for two um, marketing authorizations, one full label, and one um, skinny label which carved out a number of indications. And Sandoz went a, a step further and actually had three different options for launching across um, Europe. One full label and then two uh, slightly, slightly differing skinny label products. So where the, where the money is there, this is an option that is worth considering. But of course, as you'll remember from uh, probably previous uh, webinars, the adalimumab position also had a, a further complication, which was that there were many pending applications. And this 
um, raises the prospect of how to deal with those pending applications when you can't actually challenge the validity of those patents until they grant. And I will now hand over to you to talk about the ARROW declarations. Yes, um, thank you, Matt. I will briefly talk about um, ARROW declarations. Um, ARROW declarations are um, a relatively new tool which is used in, um, in patent litigation, in uh, pharmaceutical patent litigation. What I will do is I will provide um, a short introduction on ARROW declarations followed by some examples uh, from the Netherlands and after that I will hand over again to Matt who will uh, provide um, more examples uh, originating from the UK. Um, many of you will be familiar with uh, Gillette defense. Um, a Gillette defense is a defense which is raised in um, patent infringement uh, cases in which the defendant argues that the product or the process he is using lacks novelty or inventive step in view of the prior art and thus can never infringe uh, the patent right uh, concerned. Uh, the name Gillette defense is derived from a case um, in the UK uh, about a century ago. Um, Gillette defenses thus relate to uh, granted patents. But what we are talking about now is uh, patent applications. And that is where the uh, error declarations do come in. Um, an error declaration is basically a declaration um, which one wants to obtain from the court in which is, it is said that the pharmaceutical product or the process or the treatment was known or obvious at the priority date of a pending uh, patent application. So the difference be between Gillette and Arrow is whether there's a granted patent or whether there's not a granted patent. Um, Matt touched upon it already um, briefly that um, arrow declarations are acknowledged uh, both in the UK and the Netherlands um, and it's unclear whether in other uh, European jurisdictions um, those are acknowledged and the, the, the sole reason for that is that it hasn't uh, been tried yet. Um, that brings me to the next slide. Um, Arrow declarations, the, the name is derived from, from a case um, from Merck against um, a number of generics, um, including Arrow. Um, the case was dealt with by the courts in both the Netherlands and in the UK in 2007, so, so 12 years ago and it concerns a weekly regimen for a land grenade. Uh, Merck had a patent right. Um, it tried to enforce the patent rights in the UK and uh, the Netherlands. Um, the generics managed to, um, to get the patent uh, revoked, nullified. Um, but then uh, Merck tried to um, strike again with divisionals um, of that particular uh, patent. And at that point, uh, the generic said, well, you know, we, will, we are trying all the time to get this, um, this patent out of the way, um, and then we have one out of the way, and, and well, the, the originator um, comes in with, with another one. Um, we don't want to run to court every time, so we will ask the court uh, to grant us a declaration that this specific uh, regimen uh, for treating the disease um, is not new and not inventive uh, at the priority date. Um, so, that, so that's what um, what happened um, in the UK. Uh, the patentee decided to uh, de-designate um, uh, the divisionals' uh, concerns, uh, and in the end, the case was settled. Um, that didn't happen in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, um, there was no de-designation and the court indeed granted an error declaration. That was in 2007. And then things went silent at this, um, this point for about uh, 10 years. And after that, 
um, the arrow declarations were sort of um, reinvented, and that had all to do, indeed, with um, with biologicals, biosimilars, um, very broad patent uh, portfolios, a lot of uh, second uh, medical use patents, and um, arrow declarations became uh, useful again. In the Netherlands, uh, the, the first case after the 2007 case was um, Sinton uh, Yedda. Um, many of you uh, may be uh, familiar with uh, the situation. Um, Yedda had, um, had a patent portfolio on um, a Copaxone and uh, was enforcing in, in many jurisdictions its patent rights. Um, that also happened in the Netherlands. Um, this case we are talking about now is, is the case which is a number in, in a quite a long row of cases. Um, and the case concerned um, three patents and patent applications. There was one uh, granted patent and, and two pending applications. Uh, the parent uh, patent uh, was subject uh, to, to the nullity action in the Netherlands. But at some point uh, during litigation, uh, Yeda decided to withdraw uh, the designation uh, for the Netherlands for all three patents, so for the granted patent and for the pending patent applications. But uh, the parties continued uh, the litigation. Um, the De Hague uh, Court in the Netherlands, which is the exclusive court for uh, patent cases, um, handled the case and said, okay, well, I um, I have competency to um, to grant arrow declarations, but um, I will not grant one in this particular case. And the reason is that there are no longer um, future patent rights for this um, this particular family possible in the Netherlands because of the um, uh, the designations. Um, so uh, since and lacks. Um, legal interest. So it came down uh, to the fact, yes, uh, error declarations are possible, but no, I will not grant one now. That brings me to the next slide um, about a more uh, recent case uh, earlier this year. Uh, there, there was a case uh, between uh, Roche and Pfizer. This also concerned um, a pretty broad patent portfolio uh, related to a number of uh, patent uh, rights, patent applications um, filed by Roche. Um, and the thing here is that there were um, no granted uh, patents for, for a yet, um, but the patent applications all related to combination treatments involving bevacizumab. Um, Pfizer had started legal proceedings in order to um, clear the way uh, prior to the expiry of the patent or the uh, supplementary uh, uh, protection certificate um, for the compound patent uh, because it wanted to enter the market at that point. Roche um, challenged the jurisdiction of the Dutch court said, well, there are no granted patent rights uh, yet, so the Dutch cor court cannot um, uh, grant an order that there is uh, no infringement. This was handled by um, a PI judge in the Netherlands, and uh, she said that she is competent to rule on the request for the arrow declarations, which means that is, again, uh, a confirmation that the Dutch courts are open to grant arrow declarations. The case is uh, still pen pending and there are no decisions on the grounds of the case yet. Um, in the UK, um, arrow declarations are um, more common or have been brought to court uh, more often uh, than in the Netherlands. And that is why I will hand over to my colleague, um, Matt, now to give you some explanation of what happened there. Thank you, uh, Judith. That's, that, that, that's, that's great. So, yeah, there was a, a, a similar hiatus in the UK for about 10 years before we saw um, arrow declarations coming back again. 
Um, as you'll see from this slide, um, we have had um, four decisions relating to whether or not uh, to grant an arrow declaration. Um, so four, two, of the, two of those have been granted and two of them uh, have been refused. Um, for today's purposes, I'm going to focus on AVV and Roche, um, because both of those cases related to biosimilars. In the case of AVV, it was to adalimumab, and in the case of Roche, it was to bevacizumab. So first, AVV. So there were a number of judgments uh, sort of that happened uh, in this case um, before it came to trial. Um, and in the course of those um, judgments, the Court of Appeal clarified um, the law uh, in relation to whether or not to grant an ARA declaration. And essentially, it was necessary to show uh, a sufficient case uh, being made for the exercise of the court's uh, discretion. Uh, but the Court of Appeal said that it was for the uh, Patents Court or the High Court of, uh, of uh, England and Wales uh, to determine what the test uh, should be. And so when it came to trial, um, Henry Carr um, addressed the questions that are on the slide. So firstly, would the declaration serve a useful purpose? Uh, and that useful purpose should be in the UK. Uh, secondly, would granting the declaration provide justice to the parties? And finally, whether there are any special reasons in favour of granting the, uh, the declaration. So on, on the facts, so before it came to trial, before uh, Henry Carr, there, was, um, uh, there were developments. Uh, AbV essentially de-designated all of their uh, UK patent rights and offered the court some complicated um, uh, undertakings to uh, essentially demonstrate that AbV could not and, and, and would not assert its patent rights in the UK. Uh, the intention, uh, obviously, being to remove the useful purpose from the UK and for, in distinction to what uh, Judith has uh, described in the Netherlands, uh, if you take away the national rights, there should be no ARA declaration. Now, that's not quite what happened in AVV. Uh, so despite the de-designation, uh, Henry Carr granted or he found a useful purpose for the declarations in that they provided commercial certainty in the UK market. And that was despite, in fact, having de-designated and in fact there being no possible UK rights, because of the way it had happened and because of the complicated nature of the um, undertakings that had been offered to the court, there was uncertainty in the UK market about whether or not uh, AbV could get future patent rights. And so granting the declarations would provide commercial or more commercial certainty in the UK market by providing a, uh, something for um, biosimilar manufacturers to show to those third parties to put their minds at rest. Um, secondly, it would allow um, the supply chain um, of the adalimumab product by the biosimilars, which would go through Europe, uh, to be secured. And that, um, that was because the declarations could be shown to foreign courts in order to avoid a um, preliminary injunction. In commenting on that, Henry Carr did say that persuasive effect across Europe was not enough in and of itself um, because it, it, it didn't have the uh, necessary impact in the UK. Uh, finally, um, the declarations would serve a useful purpose because they would promote wider settlement between the parties. And then finally, on the other special reasons, and I think uh, this, is, this is the situation that makes this case particularly unusual, um, AbbVie's behavior was given as a special reason for granting the declaration. And that was because AbbVie um, de-designated its patents at the very last minute um, and shielded them from the scrutiny of both the UK courts and 
the EPO, uh, whilst at the same time uh, professing its confidence in its patent portfolio and stating that it would vigorously assert um, its patent portfolio against anyone it launched. And it was that combination of behaviour that was particularly criticised by the judge and was, and was relied on as that additional special reason for granting declaration. But it is um, uh, and remains uh, an, an unusual uh, or highly unusual case. Um, and it raised a number of different questions that um, we weren't sure of the answer to. So, I mean, how significant is the patent applicant's conduct uh, when deciding whether to grant a, a, an arrow declaration? And what commercial factors would be sufficient if he didn't have um, that uh, conduct element in in the frame, and really, I mean, the, the big question was was that the was it the high watermark for um, arrow declarations, or did it represent something that made arrow declarations much more likely um, and provide a a different tool for biosimilar manufacturers to uh, to reach market? So it turns out we didn't have uh, too long to wait to get a similar case. Um, so Pfizer Roche, um, as I mentioned, relates to Bevacizumab. Um, and it's, the fact pattern is actually very similar um, to AbV. There were multiple second medical use patent applications. Um, in response to the application for Arrow Relief, uh, Roche de-designated all of its UK rights such that no patent rights could exist in the UK. Um, nevertheless, um, uh, Mr. Mr. Justice Burse, who was hearing the case, um, held that there was a useful purpose. And the useful purpose that he identified was pretty similar to the useful purpose found in the AbV case. So firstly, it would help uh, a decision on whether or not to launch on a full or skinny label across Europe. Um, and, then, and so provide certainty uh, in the UK because, as I explained earlier on, there is only one um, marketing authorization available uh, across Europe. And if you're launching on one marketing authorization, you need to make a decision about the scope of that label. Um, secondly, uh, and this is identical to AbV, uh, securing the supply chain into the UK and promoting wider settlement. So. So far, so similar. Um, there was also similarity in the special reason, shielding. So there was no expert evidence advanced by Roche to support the validity of its patents. Um, but a compelling prima facie case had been put forward to demonstrate a lack of novelty and or obviousness um, of those patents. And Mr. Justice Burst felt that that shed, la shed light on Roche's motives, because uh, a patentee with faith in their patent are unlikely to shield. Or, and Roche provided no other explanation as to what its motives for not defending the patents were. However, unlike AbV, uh, Mr. Justice Burst refused to grant the declaration. And his reason was that. Uh, in the absence of UK patent rights, essentially there was a risk of forum shopping because this dispute had little or no connection to the UK. And so if we then turn to look at a comparison between what happened in AbV and what happened in Roche, um, you find similar shielding conduct um, of, the, of the patentees was demonstrated. Um, the equivalent useful purpose identified, certainly securing the supply chain and promoting settlement. So what, what is different? Um, so the difference is actually very thin. Uh, the difference is this, this uncertainty over the existence of future patent rights in the UK. As I mentioned earlier on, in fact, there was never any possibility of future rights in the UK in, in either case. But because of the way it came about in AbV, there was uh, uncertainty on the UK market. And it's that residual uncertainty 
that allowed um, that allowed the case to have more of a connection K. But it is not entirely clear where the dividing line um, will be drawn or should be drawn. Um, it's certain that the courts are nervous about uh, the, U the UK being used as uh, a uh, as a forum to decide uh, cases that actually should more properly be considered elsewhere and have little to do with the UK. But what, in what situation is it um, that you will suddenly go from granting a, a, an hour declaration to not granting an hour declaration? Now, so far, we have no word on either of these cases from the uh, Court of Appeal or and, and, and any case from the Court of Appeal. And going forward, it will be very interesting to see exactly what um, what the Court of Appeal thinks about this and whether the whether the differences between AV and Roche are significant enough to uh, uh, explain the difference in result. So, with that, um, I will uh, hand over to Heather, who will talk about some updates in the U.S. Thank you, uh, Matthew and, and Judith. Um, we're going to talk about some U.S. updates. And for those of you on the webinar who would like to get U.S. CLE credit, now is that time when we're going to give you the code. <laughs> the code is WFG1384. WFG1384, and with the materials uh, on the website, there's an attorney affirmation form uh, that you should be able to download. If anyone has any questions after the webinar, feel free to send us an email, but that will allow you to get U.S. credit. We're accredited in a variety of states. We can handle uh, New York, California, Illinois, and others, and you just need to enter that code, WFG1384. All right, with that logistical uh, bit out of the way, uh, we're going to take a different path today, Tara and I. Uh, Matthew and you, Judith, have been talking about this sort of more organized way to clear the path to launch in Europe by trying to get an aero declaration and get some certainty up front. And we're actually going to talk about some recent launches at risk that occurred in the United States, which are sort of making the news here. Um, so basically, as many of you may have already known, uh, Amgen recently launched two biosimilars, Invasi, which is a bevacizumab biosimilar, and Kangenti, which is a trastuzumab biosimilar. Um, despite the fact that they're in ongoing litigation uh, against Genentech, uh, injunctions that were sought against launch were denied in both of these cases. And so these are the first launch at risk scenario for biosimilars in the United States. There are appeals pending and everybody um, is certainly watching those. I'm gonna talk about the trastuzumab biosimilar. So if we go to the next slide, uh, one of the things that's really interesting here has to do with the timing of the US litigation versus Amgen's launch. And what happened here was in May 2018, Amgen sent a notice of commercial marketing. As many of you are probably aware from prior webinars, you have to send a notice of commercial marketing at least 180 days before you can launch. But the Supreme Court and the Federal Circuit have said there's not really a, uh, an, an earliest, you know, a bar on how early you can give that notice of commercial marketing. So, for example, you can give that uh, well in advance of when you actually intend to launch or know if you're going to launch. So here that was provided in May 2018, and in June 2018, Genentech sued Amgen after undergoing the sort of BPCIA exchanges patent dance. The litigation proceeded for about a year. It went through discovery. The parties produced documents. They had discovery disputes. They took depositions. Then in June 2019, Amgen's biosimilar received FDA approval. And about a month later, on July 10th, Genentech moved to get an injunction, a preliminary injunction to stop that launch. Uh, about a week later, on July 18th, the court denied it. This was Judge Connolly, who's one of the, the new judges in the District of Delaware, who's been handling this case. 
and he denied the preliminary injunction and Amgen launched. Now they have a trial scheduled. The trial had already been on the schedule for December 2019. Um, it was presumably going to be a bench trial, but now I understand from some of the pleadings it's going to be a jury trial because damages are at stake. And the real question is, well, what what happened here? Why did the court deny Amgen's injunction? Uh, uh, sorry, why did the court deny Gen and Tech's request for an injunction? They asked for injunctive relief before the launch and it was not granted. So if you turn to the next slide, uh, there are some of the factors the court went through. First of all, one of the predicates for seeking an injunction is you have to say that there's irreparable harm. I can't just get money later to make me whole. If somebody launches now, I'm going to lose market share, I'm going to have price erosion, or I'm going to have something that I'm not going to be able to fix later. Genentech tried to make arguments like that, but the district court uh, did not agree. Uh, Judge Connolly said, look, um, Genentech, your irreparable harm argument is sort of contradicted by the fact that you waited so long to bring this motion. There's a lot of things that have happened prior to this date that could have brought you to the court to seek an injunction. Amgen served its notice of commercial marketing in May 2018. Then in discovery during the case, you found out that Amgen was going to launch in July 2019. And then the drug actually got approved and you waited for four weeks after that to file the motion. The court also said that I think your damages are quantifiable and there isn't going to be irreparable harm because you've actually, Genentech, already licensed some other players. Those people haven't launched yet, but Mylan, Pfizer, and others have licenses to launch at a date certain. That date is redacted from the paper, so we don't know what it is. Uh, but that indicates to me, said the court, that there is some way to quantify uh, uh, infringing sales and that belies your irreparable harm argument. The court also said, and this is consistent with the delay point, that seeking an injunction at this late point is contrary to the spirit and the structure of the BPCIA. The notice of commercial marketing was supposed to trigger this 180 day period where you could actually hear these out and, and decide an injunction to prevent exactly this kind of situation. And then finally, the court said that because Amgen's Cangenti product has some non-infringing indications, uh, denying an injunction and letting it on the market would um, allow these non-infringing and infringing, allegedly infringing in indications to be used, uh, and keeping it off the market would prevent public access to that. Now, the parties have both appealed this, and I think what's interesting particularly as a U.S. litigator where we're used to doing and engaging in a lot of discovery, a lot of factual discovery and depositions, is the parties are really debating sort of this who knew what when, when did Amgen, you know, say it was going to launch, had they firmed up their launch plans, uh, what did Genentech know about their planned launch from depositions and other documents. It will be interesting to see if the Federal Circuit on appeal makes, uh, you know, well, first of all, it'd be interesting to see whether they uphold the uh, judge's decision or not. But regardless of their decision, it will be interesting to see how much is dependent on the unique facts of this case and what came out in discovery versus to what extent the Federal Circuit will make more um, sweeping statements that might affect future players. As an outsider watching this case now, what I think it means is that as you pass these various milestones, providing a notice of commercial marketing, producing documents that may have launch plans, being deposed or asked about your launch plans, and getting approval, at each of those milestones, the patent holder needs to think, is now the time for me to bring an injunction motion? And the uh, by a similar applicant has to be aware that whatever they do might trigger <laughs> a preliminary injunction motion. And I think there's a variety of milestones that came up in this case. The court, rightly or wrongly, thought Genentech had let too many milestones pass by before seeking relief. And for now, I think that will make everybody take a harder look at those events in a case.
And with that, I'll turn it over to Tara to talk about bevacizumab. All right. Thanks, Heather. Uh, so now we're going to move on to Amgen's second recent launch of their bevacizumab biosimilar Mfasi. Uh, so, for those of you who've been following this case, you'll recall that there is a long, complicated procedural history here. There's, I think, at least five district court cases that have been filed. Um, but due to time constraints, I'm going to try to just distill the facts down to what what you need to know to understand the court's recent denial of Genentech's motion. Um, for a TRO and to enforce the statutory prohibition on commercial marketing. So, starting at the beginning, Amgen filed its ABLA for its bevacizumab biosimilar November 14, 2016, and received approval from the FDA pretty fast in September 2017. In October 2017, Amgen sent its notice of commercial marketing to Genentech. And both parties actually filed complaints here, and there was a jurisdictional battle that took over a year to resolve. While that battle was pending, Amgen actually filed um, its third supplemental BLA in August 16, 2018. And in this supplement, Amgen requested approval to use Immunex, um, which is a subsidiary of Amgen, uh, the Immunex Rhode Island facility to manufacture bevacizumab drug substance. And then later in August, August 27, 2018, Amgen filed a fourth supplement to its application, which sought to change the labeling for Embassy. And the, the recent Genentech Federal Circuit appeal brief actually sort of hints that this label change is actually a carve-out to a recently allowed Genentech patent. Or at least it was recent at the time that Amgen filed the, the supplemental application. Um, and there's a, a battle sort of ensues between the parties between um, whether or not the supplemental applications re-trigger the BPCIA exchange process. And um, Genentech actually moves to amend the protective order in the, the sort of main district court case to, to allow them to use new, the, the discovery information that they have obtained to file a new complaint in, in accordance with the BPCIA procedures. And the the district court judge, which is also Judge Connolly, uh, sort of averts on that and says, Amgen, or, or sorry, Genentech, you, you don't actually need permission here because the protective order in this case allows you to, to use the discovery information to, to file a new complaint. So Genentech brings a new suit asserting the patents that they had listed in their supposed new 3A list based on the second BPCAA exchange resulting from the third and fourth supplement to Amgen's biosimilar application. So if that wasn't complicated enough, there's a very interesting wrinkle here in that Genentech's new 3A list actually asserts two new patents that weren't included in the previous list or the previous litigation. Now, Amgen moved to dismiss this complaint, and while the motion to dismiss is being briefed, the FDA actually approves Amgen's fourth supplement to its BLA. So now Amgen has an approved product. Um, according to the briefing around July 8th, Amgen makes the final go decision on launch, and two days later, Genentech files two motions, the first of which is a motion to enforce the statutory prohibition on commercial marketing, and then a second is a motion for a temporary restraining order based on its previous motion to enforce the statutory notice of commercial marketing. And as I'll discuss in a second, the court denied both motions and Amgen uh, launched, launched its 
Timbasi product. And what's important to note here is that there's actually a trial scheduled uh, mid next year. So Amgen is launching well in advance of their scheduled trial. So first I'm going to discuss this motion to enforce the statutory prohibition on commercial marketing. Genentech argued to the court that Amgen's October 2017 notice failed to, to satisfy the notice for commercial marketing requirement of the BPCIA that Heather discussed earlier because the Mbasi product approved by the FDA in June 2019 is different from the Mbasi product that was approved by the FDA in September 2017 and referenced in the October 2017 Notice of Commercial Marketing. Now, Genentech's position is basically here where an applicant submits a supplemental application that materially changes one of the five subsection K attributes that go to the core of the FDA's review, that filing has to be a quote-unquote application within the meaning of the BPCAA triggering the exchange process of the patent dance and thus also triggering a requirement for a new notice of commercial marketing. Because Amgen disagreed with that position and did not supply a, a second notice of commercial marketing, Genentech's position is that they should be barred from launching until they you know, complete the, the BPCA requirements. Genentech also made a sort of interesting argument in that they say because the notice of commercial marketing is statutorily mandated, the typical four-factor balancing test that a court would apply in looking at a preliminary injunction doesn't apply here. Now, um, I think Amgen took the position that, as a matter of law and fact, the Embossy application and its supplements all address the same biological pro product licensed under subsection K. And it's, it's just the same Embossy no matter what. And because the Embossy application and its supplements are directed to the same quote-unquote biological product, is defined by the BPCIA, Amgen's October 2017 notice of commercial marketing is the only notice they needed to send, and thus they should not be barred from launch. So, uh, and as in the trastuzumab case that Heather discussed, uh, Amgen also argued that Genentech's um, irreparable harm arguments were undercut by this unexplained delay in seeking injunction in that Genentech had uh, a similar sort of notice of Amgen's plans to launch and sort of sat on them until, you know, sort of the last minute. So this dispute raises a, a novel statutory construction question in that does quote-unquote application in the BPCA include supplemental applications? And the district court answered this question with a pretty firm no. Uh, the court first looked to the statute itself and found that Section 8 of the BPCIA references a, quote, a product licensed under subsection K. And Section 262K3 expressly provides that the FDA, quote, shall license the biological product under subsection K if after reviewing, quote, an application or, quote, a supplement to an application, the FDA determines that the information submitted in the application or the supplement is sufficient. Thus, the court found that the, under the express terms of the BPCIA, the same biological product can be the subject of an application and a supplement. The court then turned to the applicable regulations and noted that they defined a supplement as just a request to approve a change in an approved license application. 
court also rejected Genentech's argument that a biologics manufacturing facility and label are requirements that define the biological product and thus supplements can change features into new products. Um, the court looked to the, the express definition of a biological product in the BPCIA and, and didn't find support for Genentech's argument. So the court concluded that the fact that Mbasi was the subject of the original application approved in 2017 does not make it a different biological product than the Mbasi that was the subject of the supplements approved in, um, it was December 2018 and recently in June 2019. As such, the court found that Amgen's October 2017 Notice of Commercial Marketing satisfied the BPCIA requirements and there was nothing that prevented Amgen from launching. And I think this is an interesting issue, Tara, because you know what happened, and it goes to the heart of this debate, if, if you file a VLA and then either because you want to make some kind of change on your own or you receive a complete response letter from the FDA, you file some kind of supplement or, quote, resubmission or something, is that somehow trigger a whole new patent dance and notice of commercial marketing? And, and here, you know, the answer was no. Right. Yeah. You know, it is a really interesting situation. I think it would have been an even more interesting wrinkle if, the change to the label had added a new indication that indicated a new patent as opposed to taking away an indication. Yeah, or added an additional, uh, and I don't know if you could do this or not, added an additional uh, size vial or, you know, strength or something like that. All right. Um, yep. um, so it'll be, it'll be interesting to see on appeal uh, whether the Federal Circuit actually gets into the nitty-gritty of that or just gives a bright line rule of, you know, these supplements our application period. Um, so we'll, we'll all have to wait and see. Um, what's interesting here is that despite the fact that Genentech argued that the four-factor test didn't apply to enforce the notice of commercial marketing, they actually submitted a second motion for a temporary restraining order using its first motion as sort of the, the likelihood of success. Um, they argued that they were likely to succeed on their motion to enforce the notice of commercial marketing and then apply the additional balancing factors to say they, they were entitled to an injunction. Um, the, the court did away with that pretty handily. They, he, he said, I've already found that you're unlikely to see, succeed on your statutory prohibition motion, so I, you, you can't meet this critical prong, therefore I'm going to deny the TRO. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Genentech appealed this decision to the Federal Circuit and actually just filed its opening brief yesterday and, and sort of reiterates a lot of these arguments and, and it sort of focuses in on the, the critical change nature to, to what Amgen did and, and how it sort of puts Genentech in a tough spot to be able to enforce its patents against a product that is legitimately kind of different than the original product that was the subject of the original BPCA exchange process. So it, it'll be really interesting to see what happens next. And just to give a little context to the discussion of the Conjunti and Mbasi biosimilars, we have here um, some information about the, the pricing of these, and, and it's interesting to see that they're, they're both priced at around 12 to 13 percent below the uh, brand uh, average sale price. And one other thing to keep in mind here is that with the trastuzumab biosimilars, uh, Genentech actually entered settlement agreements with a number of other manufacturers. So we will have to keep close eye on how that market develops and whether or not the settlements in those cases allow for acceleration clauses or things like that. Uh, so with that, that ends our presentation for today. Um, we request that you please stick around after the webinar to fill out a quick survey on the content. Um, and as Heather mentioned, if you are in the U.S. and seeking credit, please complete the attorney affirmation form and submit it to us for your CLE credit. 
And as a quick reminder, we will be doing our final CLE of the year in December. So stay tuned for updates on that. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.